that I'm used to the climate A thing that if man ever found A place to live easy and happy That Eden is on Puget Sound Eden is on Puget Sound That Eden is on Puget Sound A place to live easy and happy That Eden is on Puget Hello, you are listening to The Seattle Files. My name is Chris Allen, I'm your host. Every week I get together with a different local comedian, and together we discuss the strange, unusual, interesting, and oftentimes lesser-known aspects of our local history. Joining me today is Mandy Price. Hello, Mandy. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Mandy is an ensemble member in Jet City Improv. Uh, she is performing this fall in Worst Trip Ever at Jet City Improv on Thursday, or excuse me, on Saturday nights at ten thirty. Um, she is also a photographer and has her own photography business. And you can find more about that at mandyprice.com. All those things are true. Anything I'm leaving out? Uh, no. Also, uh, every movie's a musical, which will also be playing this fall uh, or in this. I should probably know more about things when I talk about them. You, your job is just to show up and perform, right? Yeah, I don't. I, just tell I, you I where opened to do. my mouth and I realized I didn't have the the fodder to back it up. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So, uh, Mandy, how long have you lived in the Northwest? I have lived in Seattle about six years. Cool. And what brought, where, where are you from and what brought you out here? Uh, originally from Tennessee, uh, lived in Chicago for about 10 years. And then I moved out here out of a series of sordid and unpleasant events. Cool. And so now I'm here and I fell in love with the city and didn't want to leave. Awesome. And so. in Chicago, you were doing comedy? Yep. Second City? Yep. And... I toured with Second City on the uh, cruise ships for a while and studied at I.O. and performed at I.O. and the annoyance and all that stuff. Wow, cool. The usual Chicago stuff. Mm -hmm. How much do you know about our local history here? Uh, virtually nothing. Um, one time I saw a show called Skid Road that had some history in it. Mm -hmm. And I heard names that are, I also am aware that are streets. That's about it. Cool. Awesome. That's that's pretty much all you need to know. Yeah. I'm from Tennessee where we go to public school in trailers and only learn about white people. So Okay. My version of history is a little bit skewed. A little bit skewed. Yeah. A lot of Civil War stuff. Yeah. I'm uh from originally from Franklin, Tennessee, which is the home of the one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War. Wow, and so you made it out okay. I'm feeling good. I still have a limp. Okay. But um yeah, I'm feeling good now. Awesome. And you have no idea what we're going to be talking about today, correct? I do not, and I'm excited to hear. Excellent. Uh, so, let's get started. Okie doke. Franz Edmund Krefeld was born in Germany in 1873. He was raised Catholic and came to the U.S. in the 1880s, working his way to the West Coast, where he settled permanently. Uh, he is believed to have first become a soldier in the Salvation Army in Seattle before moving to Oregon to continue his work with them in 1899. Wait, what was his name? Cref Creffield? Franz Edmund Creffield. Creffield. Creffield, yeah. His name was originally Creffeld, but he changed it to Creffield when he came out here. Right, Americanization. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know any streets named after him. Uh, no, I don't think there are any. Well, good then. <laughs> so you're one step ahead of the curve. <laughs> Uh, the Salvation Army was relatively young at the time, having been founded in 1865, and didn't have the reputation it holds today. Uh, it was considered more cult-like, and its soldiers were thought of as potentially dangerous religious extremists. For the next few years, he was posted in various places around Oregon, preaching the Bible, raising funds, and searching for lost souls to convert to Christianity. Already he sounds like my kind of guy. Yeah? yeah. Evangelical? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Big fan. Uh, he went to Grants Pass, Corvallis, The Dalles, Oregon City, and McMinnville. All places in Oregon. In 1901, he reportedly received a message directly from God. What? Okay. Always good news. Please go on. I'm intrigued. Uh, God said, don't solicit money anymore and leave the Salvation Army. Its people are not entirely of God. God further informed him that he was chosen to bring forth to the people of the earth the true message of God and to preach a new doctrine. And that's why he's famous today. Mm -hmm. And we all have his Bible. Because <laughs> he was incredibly successful. Obviously. <laughs> 
Did he not tell the Salvation Army what God said? Or oh, did he? I don't know. He did, yeah. He, oh, did. He, he left the Salvation Army and became a wandering preacher for a time before he returned to Corvallis, Oregon in late 1902. Okay. Uh, Corvallis is about 60 miles south of Portland and has a popu- had a population of around 3,000 people at the time. All right, taking it to the streets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Crefield had been stationed in Corvallis before and knew many people there. He reached out to current members of the Salvation Army, trying to convince them that the organization was not of God and that they should follow him instead. Oh, follow him or follow God through him? Follow, well, follow him, follow God through him. Okay. But is there really a difference at this point? There can be. uh, Mm -hmm. I just don't know Crefield that well. Mm -hmm. And I'm aware of the Salvation Army, but um, they do continue to solicit money a great deal. They they solicit money. They do a lot of charitable work. Yes. They're very well established now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, People are pretty wary of new religious organizations. Yes. Because they can either last for long periods of time and become well-established philanthropic great evangelical organizations, or they can go real crazy real quick. Right. And they must be a relatively uh, stable organization because Santa works for them in the winter. He does, yeah. Yeah. And would Santa endorse someone who's bad? I don't think I don't. Would. I don't think so either. Not he our Santa. Not put himself on the naughty list, right? <laughs> uh, his first converts were the Hurt family, led by an upstanding and influential member of the community, Orlando Victor Hurt. Uh, O.V. Hurt. <laughs> Orlando Victor Hurt sounds like you were trying to call in a plane and I didn't know what to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like Whiskey Tango Delta. Yeah. <laughs> I paused for a second thinking you were giving me some sort of uh, code. Mm. No. No, it was uh, just, a, just a guy. Orlando Victor Hurt. Uh, or O.V. Hurt. O.V. Hurt. O.V. Hurt. <laughs> O.V. Hurt allowed Crefield to preach from his home, where he held marathon prayer sessions lasting 12 hours at a time. How thankful can you be? Or needy or greedy. I don't know why people pray. I have a lot of issues. But uh, 12 hours. I can't do anything I like for 12 hours. That's a long time. Yeah. Uh, uh, So he encouraged congregants uh, during these prayer sessions to roll on the floor and pound the ground with their fists. (laughs) Uh, I... Have no response to that. Sometimes you're just so grateful, you gotta pound the ground with your fists. So that Jesus can hear you when he's under the floorboards. (laughs) Uh, This was greeted with speculation from other members of the community, who gave the group the nickname Holy Rollers. (gasps) That's where that comes from. Well, there's other Holy Rollers out there that do similar kinds of things. Yes. But this is, it's kind of a derisive term. Yes. It's not, I mean, I think some organizations have kind of owned it now. Right. But back then it was, this was like an insult. But that's the nickname because they rolled on the ground. Yeah. That's where that phrase came from. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. And there's also no Holy Roller Street in Seattle that I'm aware of. Yeah, I don't know either. I should look it up. Mm -hmm. I I don't think there is. Okay, then no. Mm -hmm. Uh, Crefield, uh, uh, by the summer of 1903, Corvallis city officials had had enough and banned uh, Crefield uh, from holding his meetings within the city. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Crefield began holding his prayer meetings during the day, which made it impossible for most of the men to attend since they had to work. So he and the women would spend the day wailing, crying, and pounding on the floor in prayer. Oh, no. mm. (laughs) What? Those are, no, I'm thinking Mm. things. Mm -hmm. And I was making a, a... terrible thought process. Yeah. Let us in on your thought process. Oh, well, just that um, men are eventually not going to like that. Probably not. <laughs> that uh, their women are spending all day rolling around the floor with some creepy guy while they're off earning their bacon, mm-hmm. as it were. Yeah, they got paid in bacon back then, too. <laughs> I wish that still happened. <laughs> I'd get a better job. Well, you can get paid and then use that money to get bacon. Yeah, but there's a middleman involved. Yeah, that's if true. If you just gave me my bacon check in an envelope at the end of the two weeks. That's how they get you. <sighs> I'd work forever. Uh, by the summer of 1903, Corvallis city officials had enough and banned Crefield from holding his meetings within city limits. He moved his group to nearby Smith Island to live in tents. The men in his congregation had to stay behind to work, so his newly formed outdoor commune consisted almost entirely of women. He is doing this right. He is doing everything right. He's nailing it, yeah. He's nailing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, whose husbands and fathers were more than willing to trust into the care of a holy man. About 20 people went with him. Yeah. So, yeah, go on, honey. Go on. It's fine. He's he's a holy man. He's not going to do anything wrong. Go to an island and live in a tent with him and roll on the ground. <laughs> mm-hmm. the, they're 
I am both disturbed and intrigued by his methods mm-hmm. and um, considering starting my own church just to have ladies follow me around. Well, it's, I guess it's pretty easy to start your own church. I guess I it mean, is. Legally and morally, there's severe implications to it. Uh, but legally, luckily, it's, it's not... I have no moral qualms about anything. Okay. But I do know how to fill out paperwork. Oh, well, there you go. So then I'm you have all of the uh, necessary set. in order to start a crooked religious organization. Done and done. Uh, the 12 hour prayer sessions turned into 24 hours prayer sessions that is all of the hours yeah are there that's that's all of the hours in a row yeah (laughs) they would pray for a day and then presumably rest and sleep Um, it wasn't just all day every day like like shift work in the er yeah something like you're you're, on on three off two or something yeah but on for 24 then off for however long all right he told his followers quote our religion means a restoration of all things the world will be destroyed by fire, and a new world will be born, where only peace will reign. It will be like the Garden of Eden, where everything's the same as the beginning of the world, and there will be no sin. Just like the Garden of Eden, with one dude and twenty ladies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How many ribs does he have? So, <laughs> I, know. Yeah. Uh, I am now Joshua, the holy prophet. In the future, I will become Elijah, the restorer. I am to lead the twelve tribes of Israel back to Jerusalem for the restoration of all things, and the millennium will dawn on earth. Oh, somebody got a little big for his britches. Yeah, well, he's, he's doing pretty well. He got a message directly from God. I know. And now he's got all these women living in a field with him, I, essentially. Yeah, I, I really need to just take a note, because mm-hmm. he's doing well for himself. He is. I just feel like I, I know a little bit about the Bible, and this man was not in it. That's that's very true. Yes, I do. But he seems to be claiming that he was or shall be. Yeah, that he's essentially the the people, the the, the individuals from the Bible yes. are personified in him. Yes, he or, has become yeah. the the new yeah. Elijah, or like yes, or maybe it's like Menudo. Once one gets too old, they have to replace him with, oh, the, with yeah. the younger Elijah. I don't mm-hmm. know. Uh, Maud Hurt, the daughter of O. V. Hurt, was living on the island, and her fiance James Barry came to visit. He, too, was a follower of Crefield's and had even lent him some money. Crefield demanded more money, saying it was God's will and that he was not going to repay him for his previous loan. When James Barry refused, Crefield insisted Maud Hurt break off her engagement with him, which she abided in doing. Well, yeah, because God said. Yeah, you can't go against God on something like that. I, don't, I, I always wonder when people get a message directly from God or they say they do. Like, how is that message delivered? I think this person is just plain insane. Well, uh-huh. yes. Mm-hmm. No, but I think that and anybody who thinks they're getting a message from God is not insane. I mean, they think they're not insane. Mm-hmm. And they're getting this message. But because I have thoughts in my head all the time. And that's how I feel like they think God is talking to them. Like, my brain will go, oh, you know what? I could really go for some Cheez-Its right now. And then, but it's a it's a thought that's been put into my brain. Did it come from elsewhere? Like, is God telling me to go get Cheez-Its? If I were a cult leader, I might <laughs> believe that this is true. So you're starting a cult of Cheez-Its. Is um, that what I'm hearing correctly? Yes. Please go to my website where we'll find out more about that. Okay. No, I just, you know how, that's why if, 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 I don't know, this has always bothered me. When people say that they have a message from God, it, it's not like they got a written, like a letter or even like an email or a text, or it, it's usually just that something came into their brain and they had a thought. Mm-hmm. And I have thoughts all the time that I don't think came from God. Mm-hmm. And how do you differentiate the thoughts that come into your head I'm getting very political. Like, well, yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, philosophical. Philosophical. Um, like, I don't know the answer. I, I think the, the the people that are cult leaders are either delusional and or have unyielding confidence. So they're either delusional and they think that everything they're saying is absolutely true, or they're just confidence men and liars. And the problem is, from the outside, it's impossible to tell the difference. Right. Um, and then people will follow them because people want to believe something. That's depressing. It is. It is kind of depressing. Yeah, uh, and this is this is. I mean, this is clearly turning into a cult. Mm-hmm. It, well, it's I, kind of already a cult. I yeah. grew up in a mm-hmm. religious background, so I've always wondered these things about how these things come about. Mm-hmm. So anyway, well, he's he's getting messages from God, yeah. and uh, he gets another one now. Oh, good. Uh, he forbade other members of his congregation from getting married and declared marriage to be unholy. So she, so Maud Hurt's broken off her engagement with James Barry, and he forbids anyone from getting married. 
Uh, he began to purify women in a private ceremony Uh-oh. that took place inside his tent where they would pray and be endowed with the grace of love. Oh, no. Oh, yes. That sounds like what it is. Sorry, I got really upset just yeah. now. Um, I <laughs> got a little traumatized by well, this for these poor women. Allegedly, sex isn't happening. Allegedly. 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 But he's also allegedly getting messages from God telling him to do whatever he thinks is convenient for him at the time. A lot of private ceremony allegedly. Yeah. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, I, but I have a question, and I don't know if this will... Is he married? Because he has a daughter. Does he have, Did he have a wife? He's, he's not married. He doesn't have a daughter. No. Ovi Hurt's daughter. So this is oh, this is Crefield. Yeah, right. the daughter of the confused. guy, the, the family that he converted over. Yes. This is the daughter. Yeah, so he I doesn't he doesn't have a daughter. No, at this point. I can't tell white people apart. Yeah, especially when it's just names. Yeah. <laughs> In my imagination, they looked exactly the same. Everybody has mm-hmm. a beard. Uh, the male followers began to resent Crefield and his practices. Hmm. Crefield declared them to have insincere faith, faith and ordered they be shunned. Their wives and daughters, loyal to Crefield, turned their backs on them. All but three of the men were turned out, including Frank Hurt, Ovi's son. Oh. So there's still some members of the Hurt family. Okay. In the cult. Mm-hmm. On this island. On this island, yeah. Mm-hmm. And all the rest of the men had to leave. A lot of the men were banished. Banished from the cult and sent back to Corvallis. If they weren't already living there, but they were out, they're out of the group, basically. Yeah. They're not allowed in anymore. Because their faith is insincere, because they didn't want... Their wives and daughters alone in a tent. Getting a grace of blessing of love. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. The Salvation Army learned of what was happening and attempted to intervene. Hmm. They sent one of their top men to Smith Island, Charles Brooks, to investigate and try to rescue the cult members from Crefield's grasp. Brooks arrived on Smith Island and shortly after renounced the Salvation Army, burned his uniform, and became Crefield's top man. What? Uh, this man must be... I am intrigued. Like, I want to do what he says, too. He's got to be persuasive. Very persuasive. Or he's I, got some sort of magical powers. And either right? way, I am intrigued. I always, I just, I just, wonder so much about what that meeting was like. Was it either he's so persuasive that he convinced him, I am the, a conduit for God, or was it, I have created this grasp over these people that is so alluring that you should come join me? Welcome. I have tents full of women and their husbands are gone. Exactly. Yeah. Is So 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 which is it? And we don't know. And we probably never will know. I mean, m- people have given up their faith for less. Yeah, so I, that's true. And their uniforms, to a mm-hmm. lesser extent. Mm-hmm. I've burned clothes for less. But, yeah, I guess there's yeah a plethora of options as to why you would decide, yeah. but none of them seem like good decisions. Mm-hmm. And most of the people that he's converting in are already are already religious and are already uh, uh, church-going, pious people, and so he's just kind of saying, you're going on this path, why don't you come on this other path? Right. And with stuff like this, you just it just turns so slowly, so slowly, that you're in a crazy place before you can even realize what's happened. That's how crazy happens. Mm-hmm. It c- Comes on very slowly. Yes. Frogs in boiling water and whatnot. Yeah. It's... Yeah, like walking into... Easing into a hot tub. Yeah. You know? Or into into a cold, like, lake. Yeah, if you jump right in, you're a polar bear and you have a stroke. Mm Mm-hmm. That's not what happens. That's not science. I don't... Can a polar bear have a stroke? I don't know. I don't know. I'll ask one. I'll Google it later. Okay. Uh, When fall approached and it was no longer conducive to live outside, the cult moved to the Hurt household, which was just outside the limits of Corvallis. Uh, with the move came a new series of commandments from God. No more candles or any light source other than the sun to see. Ugh. No artificial light. So, why? So, but God wanted them not to stay outside in tents when it was cold. Yeah. Like, God didn't provide a fire or buildings or anything like that. You could say that God did provide a building in that... Now they have the hurt household. That's a nice way of looking. Whatever, at it. You're, yeah, you're very giving. Whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it, or whatever, however you want to justify. That was it. all mm-hmm. God's plan. Yep. Everything that happens is God's plan. No eating food that hadn't been personally touched by Crefield. Oh, okay. This is this is where he loses you, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm still caught up on getting paid with bacon. Mm-hmm. So uh, he only consecrated a small amount of bread and water each day, keeping the group weak and easily influenced. That's 
how you do it. That is some cult shit right there. That is some cult shit and some reality television shit. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's how uh, you make these people look like horrible people. Yeah, you, you, you don't feed them much. And with reality TV, you, you give them alcohol. Lots of booze. Yeah. But this is, I'm sure they're not drinking at I, this point. I don't know, but, but yeah, you're, you're really easily influenced if you're, if you're hungry. Mm-hmm. And the group must sleep on the floor, wearing very little and experience the cold. See, I am, when I'm hungry and or tired, I'm just a, just a horrible bitch. So I can't imagine this household full of hungry, floor-sleeping women. Like, it seems like it would just, like, I, I'm not surprised that the place didn't burn down within five minutes. Well, it did. Oh, shit! <laughs> <laughs> uh, first off, there was one other rule. No more talking to members outside the group, even family members and spouses. <laughs> God, I think God told me that it was going to mm-hmm. burn down. So yeah, they can't they can't eat very much. They can't use any kind of artificial light. They have to sleep on the floor in the cold, and they can't talk to anyone outside the cult. So the house was stripped of all of the furniture, which was taken to the yard and set on fire. Uh, uh, the members were also made to burn any and all personal items. So they just, they drag everything out, and they light everything on fire. Well, you'd think they'd at least want to donate it to the Salvation Army. Well, no, the Salvation Army's evil, remember? I know. According to them. Hmm? The Hertz dog and cat were also killed and put in the fire. Okay, well, that's going too far. Yes. I don't, I question God's intent, or on, at least the messages that he's sending. On murdering pets? Yeah. hmm I don't know if that came exactly from God. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing a lot of the stuff he's saying and doing aren't coming directly from God. Really? I want to believe. Well, <laughs> <it's>... <laughs> I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, neighbors went to the house after learning about the killing of the dog and cat, fearing that a recently adopted infant might be sacrificed by the cult. So they started worrying about human sacrifice. So they somehow adopted an infant? The Hurt family had adopted an infant not too long ago. Oh. So there's a baby running around, there's, too. So that now there's mm-hmm. no nothing in the house and a bunch of ladies and starving and a baby. Yes. I can't see where this can go wrong. Yeah, uh, well, the baby was not sacrificed. Oh. They did not kill the baby. Oh, good. So, a little good news. A little ray of light in here. A little bit, yeah. Uh, there was no law under which Creffield could be prosecuted. Yeah. He, he had to have done something horribly wrong. Well, he did a lot of things horribly wrong, but he didn't do anything illegal. Illegally horribly wrong. Yeah, because he's doing everything. He, all these people are willingly following him. They're willingly doing everything. He's not holding anybody false prisoner. It's all, it's all very psychological. And I guess every other law that he would have broken was not a law yet, like, and like injuring animals or yeah, you mm-hmm. know that or yeah. This is uh, this is nineteen oh three. Yeah, n- nobody had a right. really nice dogs law yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he and Brooks were taken into custody and given a psychiatric evaluation, but were deemed competent to be released. Well, yeah. Ovi Hurt decided to leave the group and kicked Creffield and Brooks out of his house. Oh, no. But since the rest of his family was still following him, he feared what would happen if they were set out in the world with nothing and rented a small house for the cult to live in just outside Corvallis. That'll teach him. Mm-hmm. Here's your own place over <laughs> here. <laughs> That'll learn you to, to make mistakes in, in a, my family. He's in a tough position. His whole family is, is involved with this, and he doesn't want to just send them out into the cold. So, so he gets them a house. So he gets them a house. Uh, Creffield, now in his early 30s, revealed to the group that he was going to marry Esther Mitchell, who was 16. I, in my head, I've been picturing him, and you probably said how old he was earlier, but he was like a much older man. With, so he's gone through all this, and now he's hitting his 30s? He's in his early 30s. <sighs> Kids are stupid. <laughs> he's a go-getter. Like... It, I might, you might be able to convince me to do something stupid, charming 60-year-old man, but charming 23-year-old man is not going to get me to give up food or beds. Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, he's, he's very young the whole time that all this is happening. I realize that. Yeah, it really makes me feel like I haven't done anything with my, like, he's accomplished all this, he's got his own cult, he's getting messages from God, and he's in his early 30s, and I... I'm in my 40s, I have no followers, Chris. Not a one. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Mm-hmm. Ruining my life. I'm 33, and I have a local history podcast. Well, you have one more (laughs) podcast than I do. Yeah. So uh, they were kicked out of the house, and he rented them a small house. 
Um, uh, so he, he decided he was going to marry Esther Mitchell, who was 16. Esther's sister, Phoebe, uh, was having none of that. <laughs> and she spirited Esther away to Portland, prompting Crefield to deem Phoebe insane and a danger to the group. It was now December 1903, and winter came with a new rule and a new name. The rule, no more clothing in the house. Oh, now you, at some point, somebody has to question this. It just keeps going a little farther and a little farther and a little farther. It's a game of inches, though. It really It's is. really just a little bit more, and then just a little bit more, and a little bit more. Yeah. I feel like every time I'm like, okay, but, yeah, all right. And everybody's so in it now yeah. that everybody you know and you're not allowed to talk to anyone outside, so oh, disobeying things... You're gone. You're you're you, yeah. you're completely disconnected from everybody. And you're still hungry, and your back hurts from the floor. So why wear pants at this point? Mm-hmm. Uh, clothes were designed to cover up sin, and they were holy people who were incapable of sinning. I can't even fathom how that is. Well, I guess if they're not allowed to do anything, how mm. how much can you sin? Yeah, uh, the cult would now be called Brides of Christ. Crefield now claimed his true mission all along was to find a woman who would become his bride, and together they would bring forth the second coming of Christ into the world. Literally or figuratively? Literally. Oh, God. Literally. Uh, Before he chose his bride, he would have to purify each and every woman by having sex with them, thereby making them virgins in the eyes of God. That is not how that works! (laughs) That is not how virginity works. It is the sir. opposite it of is, how it, it works. It is the absolute opposite of 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 purity. Is nailing someone so that they are no longer been nailed. That's not even scientifically valid. That's that's a that's a SAT question. How do you nail someone so hard that they haven't been nailed before? Well, he has to nail everybody. Oh. He has to have sex with every single one of them so that they are all virgins. So it's like this, can God create a, a boulder so heavy that he can't <laughs> nail it? Like, I don't know. Oh, what a horrible paradox. Oh, uh, that's life, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, after sleeping with every female member of the cult, he announced to his bride with B, 16-year-old Esther Mitchell the only one he hadn't slept with because she had been held up in Portland. Upon this announcement, she was put on a train to Illinois to live with family there, far away from Crefield. Oh my god, everybody's right. You do withhold sex and people just get more interested. Mm -hmm. Uh, This was against her wishes, wanting instead to stay in Oregon and remain with the cult. She was 16, they sent her away. January 4th, 1904. Twenty men from Corvallis, sick and tired of Crefield's present, went to his house, abducted him along with Brooks, stripped him naked, and covered him with pine tar and chicken feathers. Uh, point of interest, why was he not already naked? That's a good question. I don't know. Is it just that ladies could not work? I have a, if, if... He goes along his current route. I'm thinking that maybe it's just the ladies couldn't it, wear clothes. It and might men, be just the ladies. Men or had to walk around with pants on. He might already be naked, and they just drag him and pull him out. That's a time saver. Yeah, exactly. Like, we were going to strip you naked, but you're already naked, so hey. Clock, clock's a chicken. Better get the tar. <laughs> I'm going to get home before dinner time. <laughs> I'll be in time for, to watch Jeopardy. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, they tar and feather him. Literally tar and feather Literally him. tar and feather. Uh, the next day, he married Maud Hurt. Well, that's an outfit to wear to your wedding. Allegedly still smelling like pine tar. Yeah, because that doesn't No, it doesn't. Come off. It doesn't wash off quickly. That's why people tar and feather it. Especially, this is rural Oregon in 1904. They don't, they're not going to have, like, hot showers and... And it, it literally burns the skin. I mean, mm-hmm. tar is, is when, in immalleable form, very hot. Yes. So yeah. he has been burned and had feathers stuck on him. Yep. And decided this is the wedding day. Exactly. Didn't even stop to... Did he put on a tie? I don't even know. I don't know. It's hard to tell because clothes are a sin. Right. So... What about accessories? Does that count? <laughs> clothes are a sin, but accessories Exce- are fabulous. Accessorizing is from heaven. <laughs> Pants are of the devil. <laughs> but this monocle is from heaven. <laughs> Have you seen my hat? Jesus sent it. <laughs> Uh, Thirteen men filed adultery charges against Crefield, claiming he had slept with their wives. But, without admission from... Their wives, but! (laughs) Oh! (laughs) uh, Unknown. Oh. Unknown. Mm -hmm. Uh, But without admission from Crefield, admission from the women, or some kind of proof, there was nothing that could be done. Yeah, I Mm -hmm. guess that's Mm -hmm. burden of proof. One woman, Donna Starr, eventually signed a testimony that she had slept with him. 
and with a name like Donna Star, eventually became a porn actress. A porn actress or a or a disco singer. A disco singer, mm-hmm. Donna Star. Maybe a, like a roller derby girl. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Donna Star. There are two R's in Star. Well, of course there are. Mm-hmm. She's not a whore. <laughs> Uh, there was now a warrant out for Crefield's arrest. I hope he gave, had sex with her so she got another R. <laughs> I, I've got to nail the R's. I've got the... to nail the R's onto your name. <laughs> uh, there was a warrant out for his arrest, but he had disappeared. Oh, you think? Mm-hmm. Uh, no one knew where he had gone, and if anyone back at the house knew, they weren't telling. Months went by, and the cult seemed to be functioning the same with without him as it had with him. Well, who was having sex with them if he was gone? No one. Oh. Because mm-hmm. uh, marriage is a sin. Bummer. And, mm-hmm. uh, if anything, the members seem to be getting worse. Their behavior more erratic and even started putting upon themselves stricter and stricter rules. Fearing for their own safety, each and every one of them was committed to the Oregon State Insane Asylum. Yeah. The final member to be committed was taken away June of 1904. The reason no one was able to find Crefield, and perhaps why the cult members were getting worse, was because he had been hiding under the floorboards of the house the whole time. I assumed he had um, ascended to heaven. (laughs) I assumed a light came down and took his naked, tarred ass up to the clouds. No, he's he's just under the floorboards. Under the floor. That seems like a place you'd look. Yeah. You you would think so. I would. I'm no detective, but... That must and, have been unpleasant when they were rolling around on the floor and hitting the floor. And he's like, keep it down up Should there. <laughs> Got a broom handle at the mm-hmm. ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, they would have known that he was down there, yeah. of course. And he was he was having sex with them, okay. coming up from the floorboards at night and having sex with them and coming back down. Okay. Uh, but now, with every member of the cult committed, he had no one to sneak him food. He lay there naked, alone, and freezing cold for over a month. A young man looking for worms discovered him. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you look for worms <laughs> under the floorboards. Under the floorboards yeah. on private of, property of a cult house. Of a cult home. <laughs> That's where you find the best it's worms. By the fishing hole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when he was pulled from the floorboards, he yelled, "I am Elijah." Yeah. Because remember, he said that he, he was, was going to become turn into Elijah. Yeah. That's he wa- how you do it. He went on to say, "The Lord told me to hide away, and I was crucified while I was there. God told me to suffer for my people and to die from hunger and cold." And I did. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you right now that I'm dead. Yeah. Well, he died for a while. Oh. He, or he's claiming he died for a while and, right. and came back. D- didn't care for it. Does that does that story sound familiar at all, Wait Mandy? Wait a minute. Mm-hmm. I died for a little while, then came back. Uh, he went on trial for adultery. Donna Starr testified that they had, in fact, slept together, but, quote, it was to purge my soul of devils. Yeah, that's where I keep my devils, too. <laughs> In your craw. In my in my hoo ha. <laughs> Other brides of Christ testified to the wild sex and orgies they had witnessed under Crefield's command, some with girls as young as sixteen. He pled not guilty, but added, In the eyes of this world I am guilty, but God is on my side. Was was God on the jury? God was not on the jury. I think, I think God got a deferment well, because he couldn't sense. take the time off of work. Yeah, work yeah. is hard to, mm-hmm. to with you. If you got kids and stuff. Yeah, I think yeah. he was originally planning on going in and hoping that they just wouldn't call his name for the two uh, days he sat there. You're but... just sitting there reading a book, like not my name. Yeah, mm-hmm. That's, yeah. Every time I've gotten called for jury duty, I've sat there for two days and they didn't never called my name. Ditto. I've never. Yeah, cool. I actually went in once and then it was down to the very last person. If one more person had been eliminated, I would have been next. Oh wow. Yeah. Um, and so I went and I prayed to Jesus and I said, please don't put me on this jury. Yeah. I've and, always gotten uh, deferments too because I've, for, for years I was bartending and serving yeah. and it was all tips. And so I couldn't, if I was on a jury for two weeks, I wouldn't be able to pay my right, rent. So, right. uh, yeah, but so no, God was, to answer your question, God was not on the jury. As yeah. far as I can, as far as I know, it's I don't have a list of every yeah. jury. Member. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, the jury deliberated for 20 minutes and found him guilty. <laughs> Twenty whole minutes. Mm-hmm. He was sentenced to two years in prison, and with Crefield in prison, the other members of the cult who had been institutionalized were released. Oh, so they're no longer they're no longer crazy, crazy. because Crefield is in prison. Apparently, that's how sanity works. Oh, that makes sense. Then that's perfect. But that is how kind of how cults work. Well, if you if you get rid of the leader, everything else kind of. That's how snakes work, or mm-hmm. aliens. Mm-hmm. 
Aliens? Yeah. Yeah. If okay. you kill the you know, main one, all the rest. Or vampires. Vampires. That's yeah. what I'm thinking mm-hmm. of. Yeah, if you kill the first one, everything else dies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, Crefield was set free after 17 months with time off for good behavior on December 13th, 1905. He no longer believed he was Joshua or Elijah. Who was he now? He believed he was Jesus Christ. There you go. Yeah. That's the natural progression of things. <laughs> that's that's how it works. Okay. <laughs> that 17 months had been good for him. <laughs> they have like a library and you can work out mm-hmm. and stuff. So he probably exercised and taught, you know, spent mm-hmm. a lot of time in the library getting his degree in Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he reunited with Maud and Frank Hurt and called all the Brides of Christ to create a new Eden in Waldport, Oregon on the coast. In early April 1906, he declared, I have called the wrath of God upon the modern Sodoms of Corvallis, Portland, Seattle, and San Francisco. And that's why they're not there anymore. On April 18th, San Francisco was struck with a 7.8 earthquake. Shut up! (laughs) Killing over 3,000 people and destroying nearly the entire city. This puts this whole story in a different perspective (laughs) to me. (laughs) Suddenly, he seems like he had a good plan. Mm Mm-mm. Uh, any of his followers, followers who had doubted him weren't doubting anymore. I'm not doubting him anymore. So you're ready to join the sex cult? Yes, excuse me while I take my pants off. <laughs> I'm going to need someone to purify me. <laughs> uh, when Lewis Hartley found his wife and daughter had left to try and rejoin Brides of, the Brides of Christ, he tried to end the matter once and for all. He took a gun and attempted to shoot Crefield as he boarded a ferry. He used the wrong size bullets and the gun didn't fire. I feel like if you have a gun, you should know what kind of bullets go in it. But that's, again, you know, education and gun regulation. Well, Crefield claimed the gun didn't work because he was invincible. Because he f- thought the bullets the wrong size? Yeah. Like he, he, made he, them, he willed them. He shrank he them. He destroyed with... San Francisco, Mandy. He can shrink a bullet. He, he, can, he, can, do, he, can, he can affect a bullet. I'm mm-hmm. sorry. I don't know what I was thinking questioning yeah. that. Uh, George Mitchell. The brother of Esther Mitchell, the 16-year-old girl Crefield intended to marry, and the brother of Donna Starr, uh, who Crefield was convicted of committing adultery with, was in the hospital with a bad case of the measles. In his fever, he believed he was having visions from God telling him to kill Crefield. He left the hospital with the intention of doing just that. See, there's these ideas from God again. So we have two people, both with contradictory messages, both saying that they're getting messages from God. Well, I'm a, I'm indecisive too. Sometimes I'm like, oh, do I want pho? Do I want tacos? Mm-hmm. And I feel like God is maybe the same way. Do I want him dead? Do I want him nailing chicks? Mm. <laughs> That's a pretty broad swing of the pendulum there. Well, pho and tacos are totally different. That Yeah, you got me. You got me on that. <laughs> those are totally different sides of the world those, uh, those <laughs> right? foods come from. But it's one or the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, he learned that Crefield, Mitchell had learned that Crefield, had gone to Seattle with Maud. George Mitchell got there as quickly as he could and walked around the city for five days, blindly looking for the pair. He found them on May 7, 1906, in front of a drugstore on the corner of First Avenue and Cherry Street in Pioneer Square. He snuck up behind Crefield and shot him point blank in the back of the head. So how big was Seattle at this point? Seattle in 1906, this is post-Gold Rush. I guess what I'm asking is, how likely is it to walk around for five days and just find someone? Well, for five days it would have been. I mean, but it's not that it big of a city. It's at this not. Point. I mean, maybe a hundred thousand people. It's big, yeah. but it's not. It's not New York, right? It's and not, it's not Seattle today, right? But there's a lot of people, so it is pretty. It, it is probably a little bit incredible that he was able to find them. Yeah. But if he was just walking around the streets for five days, and also, I mean, most of the downtown downtown would have been smaller, right? And so, if you're looking for somebody downtown, right, it would have been probably easier to find them if you walk around for five days looking for them. Oh, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, when the police arrived, Mitchell handed his gun over and surrendered peacefully. Maud was distraught at first but quickly became convinced that he would rise from the dead. Oh, Maud. Mm -hmm. Uh, Esther Esther Mitchell came to her brother's trial in Seattle, and even after all this time of separation, she was still very much under Crefield's spell. She stayed with Maud during the trial, and they moored Crefield's death together. Oh, Maud. Now, that's like a Stockholm thing. Like she, oh yeah, yeah. Like yeah. the sixteen-year-old 
didn't want to marry him and now suddenly... Well, it's not that she didn't necessarily want to marry him. The family didn't want her to marry him. And so they took her to Portland, held her up there, and then sent her to Illinois. Oh, but I thought that was against her will. That was against her will. Oh, the going was against her will. The going was against her will. Not the wedding. I am too dumb for your podcast. She wanted to stay. She maybe didn't... I mean, I'm sure she would have been nervous... Right. You know, as a 16-year-old marrying a guy in his 30s. Who's um, been tarred and who feathered. Is, yeah, who's been tarred and feathered and who's claiming he's Elijah. Uh, but you do worse. Yeah, but no, she's she's in it. She's in the cult. Okay. They're, all, they're all hook, line, and sinker in the cult. I misunderstood mm-hmm. her. I thought she was not into it. Yeah, no. She was she was, she was was still a, a fervent believer of Creffield at this point. 16-year-olds and their crushes. Yeah, right? Uh, Esther Mitchell came to her brother's trial in Seattle, and even after all this time of separation, she was very still much in a Crefield spell. Uh, the defense claimed temporary insanity. Testimony was given about the lewd and lascivious acts done by the victim, painting him as a monster. Okay. Because he's a monster. Yeah. The jury deliberated for 90 minutes and returned with a verdict of not guilty. 90 minutes? That's more mm. than the 20 from before. It was, yeah. Uh, George Mitchell walked away a free man and two days later went to the train station to board a train back to Oregon. At the urging of the other family members, Esther went to see him off and hopefully make amends. Okay. However, Uh, she had other plans in mind. Oh, no. On the train platform, she produced a small gun, which she used to shoot George in the back of the head the same way he had killed Creffield. bitches be crazy. Yeah. (sighs) Brainwashed bitches be tripping. Oh, man. What a... uh... Well, you know what? If I had a crush and I was 16, I might have shot somebody, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, Esther and Maude showed no signs of regret. And the Seattle chief of police said, quote, I wish these Oregon people would kill each other on their own side of the river. That's a legitimate ask. It is, yeah. It would help him a lot, I think, as far as paperwork. Is All these, this Oregon cult is having their shootouts in downtown it, Seattle. Yeah, mm-hmm. rude. Yeah. Uh, there's a question over what should be done with the two women. Should they stand trial or be committed to an insane asylum? Many propose simply taking them down to the Columbia River and letting Oregon deal with them. Because hmm. they're all Oregon citizens. Maybe someone uh, should have sex with them and then they wouldn't be guilty anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's how that works, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe if they killed someone else, it would stop them from being a murderer. Yes. Because that's how sins work yes, in this you, cult. You shoot someone so that you've never shot anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, while the matter was being settled, Maud was able to sneak some strychnine into her cell and committed suicide. Okay. Uh, Esther went to an asylum uh, where she was kept for two years before being released. A few years after that, she also took strychnine and killed herself. Uh, After the death of Creffield, his cult disbanded, and many settled in Waldport, where Creffield had promised they would build the new Eden. So the cults cults disbanded, cults gone. But they all settled in the same. A lot of them settled in Waldport. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a town. That's a town. That's a town in Oregon. Oh, in Oregon. Waldport, Oregon. Mm -hmm. Okay. In 1975, okay. so much later, Marshall Herf Applewhite and Bonnie Lou Truesdale Nettles visited the small town of Waldport and held an open meeting at the Bayshore Inn. Of the 700 residents, about 100 attended. When the two left town, 20 residents left all their belongings behind and went with them. This was the first meeting of what would become the Heaven's Gate cult. Holy shit. So... These are the descendants. The descendants of this cult in Waldport... Became Heaven's Gate. Yes. In 1997, all members of the cult, Heaven's Gate cult, committed suicide, believing they were ascending to a spaceship that was trailing the hale comet. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. I was in high school. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, God... That... See, that makes... See, all these things... There are... I have questions. Okay. And is... That hereditary. I don't know. It seems like maybe. Is there something in your brain that makes you think, like that, that makes you more susceptible to being pulled into a cult that is actually can be passed down through generations? I don't know. And that, well, that brings up the nature nurture because these these people were raised by the by this would have been what the grandchildren, great grandchildren yeah. of or 1975. Put it by the grandchildren yeah. of the of the cult members. So that's, I mean, a, a lot of the same mentalities and things like that are being passed down. So well, it's, is it in the genes or is it something about the way that they were raised in their upbringings? Well, I guess that you made would have like, grandma, gr- like grandma sitting around with no pants on telling you stories of the good old days <laughs> when she didn't ever have to wear pants and was hungry and cold and slept on a floor and got nailed on a regular basis. 
Like that small grandma, tell me about the good old days. Wow, that's a that's an unsettling version of Christmas. Yeah, that's well, <laughs> that's what happens when you choose an odd religion. Your Christmas changes, mm-hmm. and that's why Santa still works for uh, the Salvation the Army. Salvation Army, mm-hmm. and Jesus works for Crefield. Yeah, I I don't know, but it is it's it's it, it might just be a huge coincidence that this is just hap- happening to where the Heaven's Gate founders came and decided. And and they were just incredibly persuasive because they, they, they traveled around and, yeah. and went to places trying to recruit people. Yeah. But this was the first meeting that they had. This is the first recruitment session that they did. I feel like if you were sane, even hearing those things as a child, you would think, well, geez, Grandma, that's nuts. Right. But how many people say, I'm never going to end up like my parents and then end up exactly like their parents? Oh, God. It's that how your parents and your grandparents are your models for how you should act as an adult, whether you consciously try to rebel against that or not, and consciously try to do something different, that seeps into you. And whatever weakness you might have in your personality that allows you to be so easily swayed by others Mm -hmm. is probably something you learned from your parents and your grandparents. Yeah. Oh, God. I know. Crazy, right? Thank God I'm never having children. Mm -hmm. So they don't become cult members? That's, yes. Yeah. By which I mean improvisers. Oh, yeah. Ah. Well, people talk a lot about improv as a cult. Yeah. After doing some research, I don't know if that's necessarily true or not. The term cult we throw around a lot, but nobody's ever told me in the things that I am participate in, because of, you know, improv and CrossFit and all the stuff that people say is a cult, nobody's ever said you need to have sex with this guy or you'll be excommunicated and burn in hell for all of eternity. But if someone did, you'd have to, because yes and. <laughs> If somebody says you're supposed to have sex with this guy and they're like, well, you're going to burn in an eternity, you're just, you're blocking their offer. That's very true. And if I were on stage, I would have to do that. That's how the law of improv cult works. I have a lot to think about. Well, thank you for listening to the Seattle Files <laughs> podcast. Uh, and thank you so much for Mandy for being here. Uh-oh. My mind is completely blown right now. I'm still <laughs> really caught up with that San Francisco thing. Uh, I'll be back next week with a new guest and a new topic. Uh, new episodes coming out every Tuesday. Uh, like us on Facebook, subscribe and rate, and leave us a review in iTunes if you can. Uh, the website is theseattlefiles.com. And if you have a suggestion for something you'd like to hear a topic for an episode about, shoot me an email at the seattlefiles at gmail.com thank you for listening and we'll be back next week next tuesday with a new episode 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 tuesday with